Hello and good evening everybody who is watching this uh, both live and recorded after the fact. My name is Jordan Jenkins. I'm the National Android Competency Lead for Sujeti USA and uh, I'm going to be the instructor for the Android Spin Group that we're going to be participating in for the next eight weeks. Uh, I'm joined by Amir Gadiri. Amir is one of our senior consultants. He's going to be one of the, uh, I guess, TAs for lack of a better term, technical assistants. Um, he's going to be helping me with, um, you know, grading and monitoring the comments and uh, teaching one of the classes and just a little bit of everything. Um, I'll also be joined by Brian Bedard, I think I'm saying that correctly, uh, who couldn't attend tonight's meeting, so he'll be on the next one, um, who's also going to be helping out. So uh, we'll get, get right into it. Unfortunately, um, I do stick to my time contract, so I only have one hour, so I'm going to try to move quickly through everything. Um, this is the Introduction to Android class, for lack of a better term. Um, so we're going to cover the basics of Android, um, everything you need just to get started, um, what to install and everything like that. So um, a little bit about me real quick. Uh, I'm a senior consultant out of our Dallas office in the U.S. Um, like I said, I'm the National Android Competency Lead for the U.S. Uh, I've been with Sujeti for two years. Um, contact info and shameless plug for my personal inside project things. Um, then Brian is a manager out of Houston, and he's got certifications out the wazoo and all kinds of cool stuff uh, for Microsoft Technologies. Um, there's his email as well, and I will send this slide, these slides out uh, after I finish recording this so that everybody will have this information since a lot of this is good general information just to keep in mind. Um, so Amir is a senior consultant uh, with me out in Dallas, and uh, there's his contact info. And a uh, quick kind of housekeeping stuff about what this course is going to really entail, because I know they kind of just said, oh, hey, we're doing this training, and everybody signed up, and they didn't really give you guys a good idea of what it is we're actually going to be accomplishing. So for the next eight weeks, we're going to go through an introductory course to Android, which means uh, you've never done Android before. You, um, you know, maybe have an Android phone, um, but that's about it. So we're going to take you through the basics of you know, making your first applications, how to organize your code, doing the UI, all that stuff. Um, in one hour blocks of lectures each week. And uh, along with that is going to be uh, the ability for you guys to have office hours with us. So it's kind of like a college course. Um, those are by appointment only. Uh, that's only so we don't sit and just, you know, uh, wait for you guys. Because uh, last time we did this uh, training, we didn't have uh, quite as many people you take advantage of the office hours as we were thinking. So if you guys don't sign up and make an appointment for us, we're not going to be on and we're not going to meet with you guys or you know make ourselves available but um, this time we are doing a greater range of time in order to try to accommodate uh, some of the different time zones even though I know that's still going to be kind of uh, difficult with the great time differences between Europe and um, India so uh, we're available from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. on uh, and that's in the central time zone if you're doing the conversion to your local time uh, I'm only available on Tuesdays uh, unfortunately, you know, busy schedule and all of that. Uh, Amir has uh, graciously said that he's available uh, every weekday evening, which is um, pretty crazy, especially because he's going to be teaching this class, or we're going to be doing this class for one of those hours. But um, you can email both of us, one of us. Um, we, you know, we'll figure out how to, uh, which one to uh, assign you guys to. So uh, it's going to be done in a Google Hangout, which is actually what we're using right now. Uh, you can kind of think of it like Skype. There's video calls, you can share your screen like I'm doing right now so that you guys can see. Uh, we can see exactly what you're doing, look at your code and all of that and uh, that's going to be one-on-one -on -one help for you guys so we can look specifically at what your issues are, um, you know, what uh, difficulties are you having with concepts or even, you know, debugging your code. Just it's your time to uh, really get, you know, the, the personalized attention that you might not be getting just in a recorded lecture, uh, especially if you're um, not in America and you're uh, watching this after the fact so that you can't live comment on things. Um, there is going to be homework in this uh, class, and it is mandatory. That's how we know that you're, you know, particip you know, they're participating, that you're grasping the material and uh, watching the videos, uh, most of all. So that's going to be due each week before lecture starts. So that means before 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, that homework needs to be submitted. Uh, how we're going to submit that is I'm going to send out to each individual person a Dropbox link 
and then uh, that's going to be personalized just to you, and you're going to drop that week's uh, project into the um, you know folder so that we can go through and grade it, uh, which should make it pretty easy for us. Um, I'm very respectful of y'all's time. I know that I personally don't have a lot of you know free time uh, to devote to training, and I'm not expecting you guys to have a lot of training. So the homework is is project based. Should take about two to three hours each week for you guys to go through and do it. Um, very straightforward. It's not you know anything really tricky or anything. It's um, you know very useful stuff that gets you billable or could get you billable on a client pretty much by the end of the eight weeks is what we're going after. So um, we're only covering really the basics of everything. So with that, we're going to get uh, right into the basics of Android, which the first question is, well, what the heck's Android? I mean, we see there's 800 different smartphones that are out there all running Android, and they all look different, they all behave different, they all have different stats. So what are we really talking about when we're saying Android and making Android apps? So really, at the very core of what Android is, is it's an operating system that's based on a Linux kernel, uh, at the very base of it, and on top of that, you're running Java. So everything that we code that's an Android application is just a Java application that we've put together um, that we install on the phone, and you install it with just basically a zip file, and uh, it then runs in a virtual machine on the uh, phone and then has access to all the hardware. So in terms of what are we using to do the development, uh, you're still able to do just straight Java uh, using Eclipse. Uh, if you're inclined to use the new Android Studio, you can use that. Um, I'm not going to recommend it for this class because it's still an early release. Um, and I don't recommend using IntelliJ, which is another IDE if you're a you know, hardcore Java developer you probably are a fan of. Um, we're going to be doing uh, all the examples that I'm going to show you guys in Eclipse. Uh, because that is the official Google platform at this time until Android Studio comes up uh, and becomes a little bit more popular, Android Studio being based on IntelliJ. Uh, in terms of what you can use to run the, uh, the code on, you're going to have two choices. You, if you have a device and a USB cable, you can run it straight on the device. Um, it does what's called sideloading or uh, just pushing it onto your device so that you can see it on your phone, tablet, or um, you know, whatever Android device that you have. Or you can just run the emulator. This is good if you don't have a device. If you're an iPhone user or a Windows user, um, you don't have access to an Android tablet. There will be some limitations to the emulator, mainly with the performance. It's not as performance, so it'll look a little slow when you start um, clicking through it and everything. But it is serviceable enough for you to do all of the homework, so that, that won't be a problem. Uh, in terms of writing tests, you do all of your tests in JUnit. So if you're, again, if you're familiar with Java and Java testing, um, we'll have a whole uh, class just on testing in Android because there are some other platform or other frameworks you can use to get some additional functionality. But JUnit is the primary test suite for doing Android testing. So, in terms of what can you do with Android, uh, Android is very pervasive and it's very customizable. Uh, there are different you know pieces of hardware that can run on. You can run it on a TV, on a tablet. Uh, they just came out with a, I think, what is it? it was a 17-inch tablet, all the way down to a, you know, a 2.3-inch smartphone, like a really tiny, cheap smartphone. Um, you have things like the hardware accelerometer, GPS, uh, near-field communication, which is an Android-only feature. Uh, no other platform has that. Um, you can access the camera, Bluetooth, um, you know, just about anything that you could think of. Uh, doing with an iPhone for the most part. Android does that plus a few extra things like the NFC. Um, you can write your own services, so not only can you have applications that are only active when they're visible on the screen, you can write services that are constantly running in the background, uh, which will allow you to do things like uh, intercept certain uh, system functions. So, for instance, if you wanted to have your own um, text messaging application, you can actually hook into the system when it fires, when a text message is received by your phone, and do something with that. In the case of our, you know, supposed text message app, you could actually intercept that and then display your uh, app's notification versus the default system's one. Uh, so that does mean that the system does expose hooks for you to tie into different events. Um, everything in Android, for the most part, is highly event-driven. So um, if it's been a while since you've run a really event-driven uh, UI project. Uh, it may seem a little weird how we're organizing everything, but you'll find it's actually very simple once you get a, the hang of it. 
Uh, Android does support push notifications. Uh, push notifications really just means log polls on a server. So what we're doing is we're registering with Google's uh, cloud messaging service, which is their push notification service, and saying, hey, I am phone, you know, the 1234, and I belong to this user, and then applications can use that service in order to push notifications to the phone. That's uh, the exact same implementation as how an iPhone does it. Uh, we have the similar thing in the Android universe. Um, you are allowed to replace every single solitary app that you see on the phone. Everything that you see is an actually self-contained application. So the keyboard, the browser, the launch screen, um, you know, lock screens, all those different components are actually isolated applications. So you can replace any of them with anything else, uh, which if you haven't used uh, Android before, uh, the big thing that I tell people is Android will actually let you customize it so that it conforms to what you do and how you interact with things. Whereas an iPhone, it's pretty structured so that you have to kind of twist yourself into what into interacting with it, how it wants you to interact with it. So um, there's a reason why Android's becoming so popular, and that's really the reason right there is the customizability of Android. Uh, if you get into uh, kind of the maybe legal gray areas, depending on your country, uh, you can actually write your own custom Android-based operating system. Android is an open source um, platform, so you can, um, you know, get a copy of uh, the Android open source project. You can write your own kernel for it, and you can release it as a custom ROM and actually flash it onto a phone. Um, you'd have to be uh, very brave and very um, well versed in, uh, you know, low level kernel compiling all kinds of weird Linux stuff in order to actually be really good at that. But you can do it. And of course, we now have Google Glasses, uh, which do run a kind of subset of Android. So you have a little bit more limited functionality, but you can um, write your own glass apps if you want to. Uh, hopefully once they come down in price since they're very, very expensive right now. So really just think of it like it's just a personal computer. It's a little hand-sized computer that you're carrying around with you. And just about everything you could do in the Windows environment on your on your um, you know your laptop, you can pretty much do the same thing in Android in one fashion or another. So this is the, the general architecture of Android. Now you don't interact with most of this. This just kind of gives you an idea of how everything's built up. So starting from the bottom in the red, we have the actual Linux kernel. So if kernel is kind of a weird word you haven't heard in a while, it means the most basic part of the operating system, the one bit that has to run all the time. So you know, Windows has a kernel, Linux has a kernel, OS X has a kernel, and all of those are mainly the drivers that are allowing you to talk to your hardware. That's all handled by your uh, device manufacturer. So uh, you know, Samsung, Motorola, all those guys are writing drivers to their their hardware and putting it into their kernels. Uh, then in the green area there we have the actual libraries. These are C libraries. So everything that you're seeing in that area, for instance the SQLite database, WebKit, browser, all of that is all actually C code. So if you open up your um, browser on an Android device, you are going straight to the C level for the rendering of that, which gives you a speed boost uh, over the Java runtime. So in the yellow area there in the Java runtime, uh, there is what's called the Dalvik Virtual Machine. So what Google did when they um, bought slash made Android, because Android actually existed before they bought it, is they wrote their own virtual machine. So they actually do not implement the Oracle Sun Java interface 100%. Uh, what they did was they did the interface about 98% of the way and then changed some of the other functions to suit how Android needed to be done. So for the most part, um, Java libraries, a lot of them can actually be used just cut and paste into Android and you can take advantage of all the work. Um, there are a lot of times when you won't want to do that just for performance and battery life and you know other concerns that you don't really worry about on the desktop. But it is very similar to the Java virtual machine. Um, it's just called the Dalvik virtual machine. And on top of that we have the actual application framework which is more or less your um, operating system if you will. Uh, level of things. So you see things like different managers for the resources and um, you know basically systems that will be running all the time you're running your actual Android operating system. Um, as soon as you see kind of your home screen all that stuff is loaded in and it doesn't stop. It just keeps running. And then on top of that are your actual applications. So uh, as you can see here your home or launcher screen is an application. The dialer that you're using to dial is a you know, launch or is a uh, application so um, 
all of those also can be talked to. So if you want to, um, for instance, open up the dialer and give it a number or open up the default email app and pre-populate it with an e email content, you can do all of those things and we'll actually get into how that's accomplished a little later on when we start talking about activities and intents. But just know that there are um, interfaces between all of this. These are not isolated components that don't talk to each other. Uh, they actually have a very nice way of, of communicating. So this is now stepping into our actual Android application. And as I said, everything is event driven. So this is probably the most important document or you know, image that I'm going to show you guys because Android um, lives and breathes on this life cycle of their applications because of um, the event-based nature of everything. Uh, you have to implement all of these different events and uh, know kind of when everything needs to be done. So I'm going to spend just a minute on this, although there is a very good explanation on the Android developer side of when, when all of these happen. So basically when we click the, uh, say, the shortcut on the launcher screen to start our application, it's going to call the onCreate function of our default activity. And you can think of an activity pretty much as a page, and it implements this entire life cycle even within your application. So we open up the default page, and we're going to go into the onCreate method. The onCreate method really is to do things like get our view ready, um, you know, maybe start rendering all of the pieces that we need, uh, start any background listeners that we might need. So for instance, we want, might want to turn on our GPS if we're writing a navigation application or something like that. Then you'll see the on start. Uh, get fired if we're kind of you know moving our way up the tree here and once your application is done with the on start function it's going to be visible to the user so whenever it's on start that's any kind of activities that you need to run that need to be done by the time the application is actually visible so for instance you might have a requirement of uh, loading in data from the da this database you know that's on the device uh, you could have the case of needing to load up static resources like images or something like that. If you need to do things like that, or maybe any default manipulations, then that all can be done in the onStart method. So once we've been started, uh, there's another state that we can uh, enter into, which is we can actually go into paused. And if you see that, what we have to do is go into resumed and then over to paused. So what happens is uh, you're going to have a state where uh, paused really just means it says right there partially visible which really means that uh, you're still uh, within the application you may just be in a different activity so for instance let's say that uh, I go and start another activity uh, maybe a different page of my application my applic the main activity that I had would be marked as paused it's still partially visible because we're still in the same application but it's not actually in use so during this time, you, you can still execute part of the activity if you needed to, but it's not recommended because you're going to start um, you know, harming resources. And then you'll see if we go back to the original activity, we're going to hit into the resume state. And once we hit the resume state, that's kind of the default state that everything goes into. So we can have the case of you know, after we've started and, resu and done resumed, basically at the resume state, you can start interacting with the application again. So there's the case then of what do we do whenever we, you know, close the application. We hit the home button and actually close out of the application. So for a while, your application will actually just go into the pause state. And so, you, again, you can still run background work if needed to be done. Uh, for instance, if you needed to pull in more tweets or anything like that. But eventually, uh, two things are going to happen. One, your activity is going to go into the on stop. And stopping it really just means... Um, I don't want you to execute things anymore. And uh, the Android operating system will call the on stop function in order to tell you, uh, you know, quit executing, just clean yourself up and, and get to where you're at a good place. And that's really the point in which, uh, in order to start it again, it's actually going to hit the started function and then uh, go back into the on resume. So you'll see it hits on restart on, you know, resume all the way up. So um, if we do get into the case, though, where you need the memory back, we don't just need the CPU uh, resources back, we need the memory back, uh, your the um, memory manager will call the onDestroy function of your application, which is really your last-ditch effort to get rid of anything that you're holding on to. Uh, in Android, we don't really want to hold on to system resources any longer than we have to, so things like the camera, the GPS, anything like that. You typically, if you're not visible, you don't 
uh, lock that you'll unlock those resources. Your on destroy is your last chance to get rid of anything that you're still holding on to. Otherwise, you'll cause a memory leak uh, that's going to be, you know, not very pleasant and could even crash the entire operating system. So, um, on destroy is very important to know exactly what resources you have open to know how to get rid of all of them in order to make sure that uh, you're being memory conscious because you are kind of having to be a good neighbor in terms of the Android ecosystem within, within the phone itself and to not hog resources and to not um, you know, drain the battery life or anything like that, uh, which is part of kind of the optimization behind Android. So these are the my essential list of resources. I really only have three things that I tell everybody who's starting to learn Android uh, where to go. Uh, the first one is the Android Developer Portal. The Android Developer Portal has everything you need to get started. Uh, the first thing it has is the Android um, Development Toolkit, which is going to give you a copy of Eclipse. Uh, the SDK, the plugin for Eclipse, is going to give you an emulator image pre-downloaded for you, um, and all in a nice little package that if you're on Windows or OS X, anything like that, you just unzip it and you're ready to go. Um, it also has uh, guides that you can go through, which will tell you pretty much how to do most of most of the homework. Excuse me, and uh, has guides on things like, okay, I want to implement, um, you know, push notifications. How do I do that? It has a guide on how to do that. Uh, then, if you're looking for the actual official Android references, the Java docs for everything, that's also on the developer portal as well. So, tons of good information on there. Uh, that's usually the first place I go when I have a question about um, any kind of specific implementation or functionality with, within Android because it is kind of the official site. Uh, there is another site that is uh, just a killer site for Android development. They've got ludicrous amounts of uh, resources, which is Vogella.com. And not only do they have a, a get-up-to-speed quick Android course that covers way more than we're actually going to cover in this course, uh, they have a course specifically on optimization and testing, and they have an even an expert level course, which we'll get into very um, you know advanced topics that again we won't be getting into in this course. Uh, if you're more of the book type person versus the uh, website type person, uh, I do recommend Android Application Development. It's a little bit outdated because I think it covers 4.0 only, so it's about a year behind, but it still has a very good resource, and everything that we're going to be doing is going to be covered in that book. So if you feel the need to to go out and get a book. Um, that's a really good one that I recommend and like I said I'll send the slides out so that you guys will have access to uh, these links for easy uh, perusal. So um, with that uh, I would ask if there's any questions but I don't actually think anybody's watching this live I'm not sure. Uh, Amir do you, do, do you see any <laughs> comments or anything because I don't think anybody's actually watching this live. I'm seeing uh, no feedback at all. Um, I don't think, it, yeah, I don't think anybody's actually watching this live. So we'll just uh, continue on with recording this video. And then, uh, if you guys have any questions, um, I sent out a link to the Google Groups. If you post into, well, well, I would get everybody added into that. And then, if you post into that, it'll actually email out everybody in the class, so that um, you know we're not having you guys asking us the same ten questions over and over and over again. Uh, we can all just have it, you know, answered in one. So, what I'll do real fast is show you guys. Um, I'm doing on time. Uh, show you guys real quick those resources that I mentioned. So, the first thing you want to do is download the Android Developer Tools. Um, like I said, this is actually gives you everything that you need. Uh, this has got, you know, the full copy of Eclipse, um, graphical UI builders, which I'll show you guys what those actually mean. They're very nice. Um, the ability to bug everything that you're doing and uh, pretty much everything that I'm going to be showing you is contained within that. So uh, there's all kinds of good stuff. Um, and then you can go in here actually into the API guides. This has all the uh, essential kind of reading if you wanted to learn anything about, for instance, content providers, which we're not going to uh, actually get into. Or, um, you know, if you wanted to learn about the user interface and maybe learn a little bit more about um, some of the things that we will just be kind of glancing over. Uh, if you wanted to get a little deeper dive, this is the place to go to get um, really nice, well-documented, easy-to-follow guides. And then there is the uh, the full reference here if you wanted to actually go into the, you know, like I said, the Java docs of it. Uh, they have all that here. Um, this is the Vogella site, 
And um, for instance, for some reason, I actually pulled it up in was this German? Maybe I don't know. But um, you can see all again all the things that they'll show you how to do. Um, a lot of the stuff is even stuff that we will be getting into um, later on in the course. If you feel like reading ahead and getting ahead of the game, um, it does have access to things like uh, networking, which we'll get into, I think, in the third class. Uh, so we get pretty quick into that. Um, very good site, like I said. Um, I'm not sure why it's not in English, but um, another one. So uh, this is actually how I'm doing the... Uh, mailing list. Uh, it's actually a Google group. So if you guys want to use this instead of doing it via email, this is also a good way of doing it. Uh, if you guys can, please in the next week send me your preferred email address and I will add you on here as a member so that you get everybody's emails when they uh, when they ask a question. It'll actually send you an email and let you know that there's a new topic and you can respond with email, uh, which should make it um, you know, pretty low friction. Uh, again, this was a resource that not enough people took advantage of last time. So I highly recommend if you have a question before going straight to the office hours, maybe ask it here because you never know when somebody else might have had that problem and solved it and uh, they could solve it to you so you're not just trying to do your homework in the last day. So with that, we will get right into Eclipse. Um, I do not know how competent everybody is uh, with uh, Java development or even Eclipse in general. Um, there are some different things that uh, there are in um, the Android specific version with the Android plugins. So I'm going to cover some of those so that uh, you guys are aware of how to use this stuff whenever you start making your first application. And then if I have time, uh, I'll go through actually creating your first application, which is going to be your homework for this week. So um, in the general layout of Eclipse, uh, you have your file browser here on the side. Um, for me, I have tons and tons of open projects, but um, your project folders, uh, we'll get into that when I do kind of the hello world because there's um, a lot of stuff to it. You have your files get opened up in here in the main area. On uh, the bottom here, you have the controls. So we have your problems. If you have any errors, um, you can pull up Java Docs and uh, see in actual consoles. Um, what's very useful is the log cat. So everything in Android is fed into a centralized log that is then fed out through the USB when you connect it. So if you actually connect to your USB device um, and start running an application, it'll actually show you what's going on. You can actually output things. So uh, for instance, in Java, you're familiar with printing out a string in a console with system.out.println. That actually still works in here. That'll actually output it right into this log. And so by filtering it by what application's running, you can actually go through and see what your application's doing if you wanted to have some debug information. So um, there's a couple of new buttons here. Uh, these are going to be, you know, you have your standard uh, set of buttons here, you know, debug, run the application, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But right here, these are the two new buttons uh, that are up here on the top. So the first one here is the SDK manager. So to build an application, for a certain platform of, or a certain version of Android, you must install the platform tools for it. Uh, the platform tools are broken down into these uh, subsets. So you have the documentation, the actual SDK platform itself, which is required for you to have installed 100% um, in order for you to even build anything. You have the samples if you're looking to um, have a pre-made project. They have pre-made projects that implement some of the functionality if you, uh, you know, wanted to actually see a, a real example. And then they have system images here. So there's an ARM image, which is for most of your smartphones. Almost every smartphone runs on the ARM platform. Uh, the Intel Atom platform is for, um, as far as I know, there aren't a whole lot of uh, ones that use that, but that would be, um, for instance, if you wanted to have the, your Android running on an x86 platform. And then there's the MIPS system image. Again, this is uh, very specialized for very, uh, certain phones that use the MIPS processors versus ARM. Uh, the Google APIs here, if you check that, will give you access to that version's uh, Google APIs, which will allow you to do things like in-app purchases, um, interacting with the Play Store, things like that, um, Google Maps, things like that. So I do recommend um, downloading that. And then you can get the sources for all of the SDK. And the sources are really good for uh, when you're doing line-by-line debug -line debugging. What will happen is if you do not have the sources installed, when it steps into uh, one of the native functions, you won't see anything. You'll get an error that says we can't find the sources for this, so we're just going to uh, not show you anything. 
So I highly recommend uh, as you guys get into it, viewing the, uh, downloading the sources for your version. Um, we're going to be building everything to the 4.2.2 standard, so um, just go ahead and download the source for this. And it's real easy. You just click, click everything that you want to have, just hit install, and then it'll take care of the rest. Uh, so that's step one of getting everything set up. And step two is the virtual device manager. This isn't going to be so important if you plan on using your device for everything. But um, if you come in here, you can make different virtual devices. They can have different resolutions, different CPUs, and all of that. So if we go in here, and let's call this... Uh, this Uh, you can see I can actually emulate various devices, so the Nexus 7, the Galaxy Nexus, and it gives me the dimensions uh, physically, the number of pixels, and then uh, what uh, resolution it uses. So there's different resolutions for different phones, uh, which this can all help with your testing if you don't have a lot of devices, but you need to support multiple devices. So let's, uh, for instance, choose a Nexus S. And you'll see it populates most of this with me based on what that phone has. Uh, if I pick a more generic device, uh, it may not have what you need. Uh, so we'll pick the Nexus S again. You can see um, that if there's a hardware keyboard, um, I do recommend going ahead and checking that because it makes it a little nicer to type on the keyboard versus having to use the on-screen keys if you need to type something in. Uh, and then you want to display a skin with the hardware controls. That will allow you to emulate the buttons. So if you wanted to have the volume up, volume down, um, power button, etc. Uh, you can also turn on cameras. Uh, there's two ways of having the cameras. You can use either an emulated image, which will just show you as a kind of you know, moving little image to take a picture of, or you can actually use your webcam if you have one on your machine, um, which can be good if you need to do things like testing barcode scanning, for instance. Uh, it's good to have that you know, so that you can actually hold up a, uh, you know, your, a UPC code or something and let it scan it. Uh, for the memory options, I do recommend setting the RAM to 512 or up. It just seems to run a little bit smoother when you do that. Um, and sometimes you'll get a, a weird crash if you don't set it to 512. Um, VM heap you can leave alone. Uh, the internal storage is actually how much memory you can use to uh, default install applications. You can usually leave that at the default. Uh, SD card, the uh, SD card is optional. In Android, you can take it out at any time. So um, if you wanted to emulate it, though, you can put in an amount. So I'm going to just say 50 megabytes. And then you have two emulated options. One is snapshot, and one is use host GPU. You can only have one of these checked, even though these look like these are two checkboxes. It'll actually tell you you can't use them simultaneously. So use host GPU will allow it to have a little bit smoother graphics by utilizing your GPU. Um, That'll help, especially if we when we get into the maps portion of things. Um, however, you that means that the state will not be permitted between or will not be persisted when you close down the emulator. Every time you start it up, it's going to act like it's the first time you turned it on. So the trade-off is you can either have it remember that you're, you know, what apps you have, you know opened up and what the settings are and everything, or you can have it render a little bit faster. Uh, I almost always choose to have it render faster. Uh, it makes a significant difference. I'll go ahead and tell you it's very worth to have that checked on. So if you see that, then I have my new emulator here. Uh, I'm actually going to edit it and make it a current version because I don't want it to be all the way down there. That's bad. So let's pick the current version here. Go ahead and save that. And then you'll see now if I wanted to start it, it will start a virtual machine whenever you hit the start button uh, here. Or if you go and actually run the application by clicking on the, um, the debug or the little play option here, it will spin up a uh, virtual device if it doesn't detect your phone being plugged in. Otherwise, it'll default to your phone. So um, these do take a while to turn on, so I'm going to actually go ahead and turn one on. And let you guys um, how it boots up and you can see it makes a uh, you know pretty interesting uh, loading screen and everything we have our controls here on the side and then this will actually be our phone uh, interacting with it is just a matter of clicking and dragging to uh, interact with it and we'll come back to that later so there's a couple other things that are going to help you as you start making your applications um, this is the primary uh, Java view but there are other views that we can use to get a little bit more insight into what's going on on our device while we're uh, you know, debugging it. 
So the first one is, of course, the debug view. The debug view gives us all kinds of uh, interesting uh, things to look at, just presenting it in a different way. We can look at some code uh, and actually step through it. Uh, through here, you can see your application stack trace will show up in here. Uh, if you wanted to see what's going on, uh, you can have variables and look at the variables right here, set breakpoints, all of that. Uh, you see your console right here. Um, for the most part, the application stack is going to be uh, very important because Android does tend to jump around and go very, very deep. It's uh, highly object-oriented. So you can expect, you know, one line on your application may cause it to go down in the stack 10, you know, 15 uh, files. It just depends. So um, very good to kind of know where you are on the stack to help you with uh, knowing when to skip over things. So the other thing is the DDMS view. This is mainly used for um, you know, performance benchmarking, battery life tests, things like that, um, but also has emulator controls. So I'm going to hope that it opens up here. Eclipse seems to have frozen. So what I'm going to do is actually kill it and start over again. So I know this is kind of a, a whirlwind uh, class. This is kind of the fastest class that I have. I, there's a lot of material that has to be covered in just an hour. So I'm trying to make sure that I can get through all of that. OK, so here we go. Let me full screen this. As much of this as possible. Um, for future classes, I'll actually change the resolution of my screen so you can see my code and stuff. But I'm just going over the general aspects. Um, right here, you can see the device. You can see this is the emulator that I have. You can also see. Um, all the processes that are running, um, what their you know PIDs are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is very uh, useful, especially if you wanted to see if another application could be causing an issue with your app. Um, clicking on this will actually allow you to see the threads. So let me actually pick and see if any of these will actually enable threads on these. Uh, actually. Thread count. There we go. So now you can see that I'm tracking this, and actually I can see the number of threads. Uh, Android does like to have uh, a fair number of threads for everything, so this can be good in order to see, um, you know, which threads are active and everything like that. Uh, gives you a much better view. You can also see the memory utilization, your heap. Um, you know, actually watch it allocating memory. Uh, if you wanted to see, you know, per maybe why it's. Um, Bottlenecking, um, you know, maybe manually cause garbage collection, something like that. Um, you can look at allocation tracking, which uh, not super useful for what we're going to be doing, but um, can be useful um, in larger applications. Uh, this is a good one. This actually lets you see network statistics, so you can actually see. Well, this is an emulator, so it's not going to work, but. Um, this on a phone, this would actually let you see um, how much network utilization you're doing. So you can, for instance, say, okay, well, my application's hanging, and it's maxing out the speed. Um, you know, maybe it's, the, it's on the server. If something's going wrong with the, on the server, and it's just sending me a bunch of data back or something like that. So there's um, you know, a lot of usefulness in that. Uh, the File Explorer will show you all of the um, device's uh, internal memory and also SD cards. So SD cards get bound right here to where it says SD card. And uh, that can be good if you're writing any, anything into the um, file system. Uh, this will let you actually look and make sure it's being created, which uh, you can't do on the emulator just by itself. This is the way you would do it. And then since we are using an emulator, we have the emulator controls. Uh, this allows you to do things like emulating different speeds of data, uh, introducing latency uh, to make it a little bit more realistic in your testing, um, you know, setting your voice and data to roaming, something like that. Um, which can be helpful for testing. Uh, you can emulate a call, so if you wanted to actually put in a number, one, two, three, four, five, four, five, six, seven, six, seven. Um, you can actually emulate a call on a phone, and it will uh, show you what the application does in that case. So for instance, if you want to pause your application whenever somebody takes a phone call, you can emulate it with that. And then this will become uh, very important later on. This actually lets you set the location of the GPS on the emulator. So um, when we get into doing uh, GPS 
uh, locations, the way that you update it when you're using the emulator is just to put in a value in here and hit send, and it will immediately update on the device so you can have a little bit more granular control of everything. Um, there's a lot of other functions in here. Um, I recommend you guys um, you know, take some time to kind of dig through this so that you know where everything is. Um, you know, kind of build up your debugging tool belt because um, there is going to be uh, a lot of debugging that I, I know you guys will end up doing just because of the, uh, you know, fact that you're, you know, first-time users for the, for the most part. Some of you might actually have done Android before, but for the most part you should be first-time users. Uh, so you guys will make mistakes. It happens. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, in fact, I encourage it. So, um, with that, I believe I've covered everything that I need to do on the UI here in terms of things you need to do. Uh, we'll go ahead and get into um, the homework. You guys get the first one for free. Uh, you guys just have to do this and submit it for homework, and that is to create your project. So to, go, to do that, we just go to New, and then we say Android Application Project. If you don't see that up here, you can also find it under Other, and we go into that. It's going to take us through uh, a wizard. I'm going to sit, let you guys or walk you guys through this real fast so that um, you're aware kind of everything that you can have. All of this is reconfigurable, so you don't need to feel like you're, um, you know, committed to this and you have to restart your project if these, the, all this needs to change. So I'm going to call this uh, spin. You know, let's call it spin group two, I guess. Um, and then, uh, so you have an application name. This is actually the display name that's going to show up on the Android device itself. So, for instance, uh, if you go into here, you'll see this has downloads, um, gallery, custom locale. All of that is controlled right here by the application name. Then you have a project name. That's the name that shows up right over here. And then everything in Android has to have a unique name. So the way that you give the package a unique name is uh, what's called the reverse URL format. So for instance, uh, you start with uh, the last bit of a URL, so in this case it would be com, then you're going to use, uh, for instance, and then you're going to have the URL sujeti.com, and then you're going to have your application name. So in this case we're going to call it spin group 2. So this has to be unique. Uh, if this is not unique, what will happen is if you try to install it, it's going to tell you that an application with that name was already installed, and you're going to have to either change it or uninstall the uh, conflicting application. So the next bit of this here is um, your SDK requirements. So your minimum required SDK means that any uh, phone that goes to the Play Store or tries to install your app and it's below this version won't be able to install it. Uh, this is usually means that you are using some functionality of the uh, newer APIs that you don't get uh, in, say, 2.2 here. Maybe I'm using, um, you know, fragments without compatibility or something like that, so I need 4.0 as my default. Um, right now, just to give you guys a, a kind of a, a quick look at what the ecosystem is looking like, Gingerbread just hit 33% uh, of the install base. Uh, I think uh, Froyo has another third, and then uh, the rest is split up between all the newer versions. So um, typically uh, what we do, in at least in America, is we uh, build everything to 2.3 and up if we need to support all devices like on a consumer app, or if we're recommending to a client what applications they should install or what hardware they need to buy, we usually tell them go with the latest and greatest, do um, you know, 4.1, 4.2. Um, which also just gives us a lot of better flexibility with, um, you know, using some of the, the newer features that are really nice in Android. Your target SDK is kind of your wish list. This is what I wish it would have. Uh, that's usually almost always the, the newest version. And then uh, you can actually set it to compile with a different uh, SDK. Uh, if you do that, however, and you're using, say, features in the 4.2 version, such as uh, launch uh, the launcher notification bar having uh, buttons on it. If you use that and you try to compile it with an earlier version, it's going to throw all kinds of errors whenever you try to run it and crash your application. You're not going to probably know what it is. So um, again, usually you stick to this with the latest version. Now the theme of your application, again, this can all be customized. This is just kind of to get you started. Um, the hollow theme is the new uh, Android 4.0 
one, it's um, either dark or light with a contrasting color on the other side, um, fairly monochromatic. There's not a whole lot of color in it. There's like a little blue. That's about it. Um, so you can do it with either all dark, which is um, black background, white text, or light, which is white background, dark text. And then you can also do it with this uh, default, which is the light, and then the action bar, which is the bar at the very top of your application by default being dark. Um, this is all customizable, so I'll just leave it with the default, and you guys probably will too, uh, just for the sake of um, getting this all set up. So next, uh, we have the ability to create a custom launcher icon. Uh, you will never ever use this on a client because they will give you an icon that you will use. Uh, most likely, you're going to make it yourself. Um, I'll show you guys the creator just so that you guys will be able to use it for our training purposes. But again, you don't usually click this on a client. And then definitely uh, leave this checked to create the default activity. Uh, that way, you'll basically get Hello World for free, and you'll be able to um, start it immediately and run it. Um, if you're writing a library uh, that's going to be used in Android, and this isn't actually an application, you can check this here uh, so that it handles it a little bit differently. And then uh, from this, this is just where you want to put the application. And if you wanted to have working sets, um, I don't personally use those, but you can add that all in here. So now that we checked that we were making our own icon, it gives us a default here. Um, we can start with um, you know, clip art or text or an image if we have one on our computer. So what I'm going to do is uh, just start with text because um, I like making really ugly icons just for the first one because it's just, uh, you know, I'm not a graphics person, so it's fun for me. So i uh, Jetty here, and we'll change the font to, I don't know, something else. Uh, that looks good. And we will, uh, you know, add a little padding, and then you know, center it and put a shape behind it. Let's do, I don't know, a circle. And we'll just kind of change the colors here to be, uh, you know, somewhat the Sujeti colors. Not sure if this is really going to turn out like I'm want, wanting it to. No, that needs to be bad. I need to make that a white kind of color. So we'll set that like that. And there we go. We've got our application icon. It looks horrible, but like I said, this is very easy to change. So um, I'm just going to leave this as is. So the, uh, la the next screen here, this is for when you're creating your activity. Uh, they do have pre-made activities for you. And the first one is your blank activity, which is the default. Uh, it just means don't put anything in there. Um, the next one is a full screen activity, which would allow you to um, take everything and make it full screen. Uh, this is useful usually for video games and uh, the like, where you need every last pixel that you can get, including the top bar and the um, bottom bar, as you can see right here. And then uh, the master detail view, we will do this for our second application. Um, what that is, is it's kind of as this drawing shows, you have the, the master list of content, and clicking into it will show you details of that. So for instance, it, uh, what we're going to be building is an RSS reader. So you'll have the list of articles here, and if you click on it, you'll be able to view the article. And the advantage of doing this uh, using the template is that that is phone and tablet compatible so that when you're on the phone you will see this page right here that has the list of things and when you click into it you will see a page of all the content with a back button right here whereas on a tablet you will see this all in one view so that you can immediately you know have this persist right here while you're changing the content so um, for our activity for the first one we're going to do you guys just do a blank activity um, we're going to do it all from scratch uh, as we start and then uh, your activity has to have a name. Um, by default, that's the main activity. Um, what we're going to be building, just so you guys are kind of aware, um, is uh, basically a Foursquare clone. We're going to build an application that will uh, interact with the remote server to allow you to do check-ins, as it were, uh, saying that you were at a certain place doing something fun. And uh, then uh, we will actually all be putting that in the same data pool so that uh, we can see each other's check-ins, which would be kind of cool to see it kind of all over the world. So the main thing that I want to do with this application is show a map for the main screen. So I'm going to map activity. Um, eventually we'll put a map in there. Uh, it won't be till the very end, but um, I'm going to go ahead and name it that so I can do that. Now the navigation type, uh, this will allow you to have um, pre-made navigation layouts if you wanted to do them. Um, what we're going to be doing is none of those. We're going to just set it plain. 
because we're, our app, the first app we're going to do is very basic. It's not going to be complex enough that we're going to uh, need any of these navigation types, even though you can also add them in after the fact. So by hitting the finish here, it's going to go and generate the project for us. And you'll see over here I should have uh, spin group 2. And what this has now done is given me uh, you know, the full project layout, generate all the files for me, and taking me into this uh, UI view here. So the first thing you usually do is lay out the UI um, in the default activity. So um, we will get into this a little bit more. Um, I feel like I'm going to start running low on time, but I want to show you guys how you can run this to make sure that you did everything correctly. So I've got my emulator running. Um, all I have to do, and I can't do this on an XML file since Eclipse does not, recommend, does not recognize this as a source file, is I'm going to open up the source for my first activity here. It's all in one file, just like this. And I'm going to hit the uh, play button just to tell it to run the application, tell it to run it as an Android application. And then you'll see in the corner here it says launching spin group 2. What that's doing is it's, com it's compiling it down it's going to install it on the device, and then it's actually going to turn it on for me. So if we sit here for a second, what we're expecting to see is it's going to pop up here. Now, I can make sure of that by looking at the console. And since there's nothing in the console, that probably means that it's not working. So I'm going to hit it again, see if it'll pop up. There you go, see how it's going in there. And there you go, there's our application. There's your, you know, hello world uh, put together by default just by generating it. Um, you know, we didn't have to type anything. We didn't have to, you know, do anything besides create our default project. So um, that's pretty much it. Um, from there, we can go in and, you know, start changing the UI, adding things in. Um, you guys don't have to worry about that for this first week because I didn't have enough time to actually uh, get into how to do uh, some of the stuff that we're going to do um, with laying out, laying out different activities and, and going between them. So um, you guys don't have to worry about that. If you do this much and send it to me, you're good to go. Um, I will ask you guys, just because uh, each of these has to be unique to make it a little bit easier for us to grade them, if you will call the projects um, your name one. So, um, for instance, mine would be Jordan one. Uh, you know, yours will be your, whatever your first name is one. That's just so that we get unique... Uh, names or if you guys want to do it by your last name that's good too so that um, we can load these all up in here and um, run them because uh, your homework is going to be checked so we're actually going to be going through and making sure that your homework is complete um, and also looking at the uh, code standards so um, as I understand it there's actually different standards for um, the different uh, if not the different countries then at least the different continents um, I will send you guys out the the uh, U.S. version of the Android standards. Um, it's pretty much follow whatever Google tells you to do plus a few other things. Um, if you guys have different standards, uh, go ahead and send them over to me. I'm always looking for other standards um, to integrate into the American one. So um, I can what I can do is I can look at um, you know where there's similarity and where there's differences and um, you know give you guys feedback on whether that's, um, it's kind of, you know, what you're doing will probably be fine either way, but um, just show you if there's a better way based on your standards um, that'll make you it easier for you guys to integrate when you go into a client and become billable. So um, with that, I've got about five minutes left. Um, I don't think anybody is on this um, live session, so there's no more questions. Um, so again, if you guys have any questions, um, first off, shoot me an email with your uh, preferred email, if it's your Gmail, if it's your, you know, Hotmail, or uh, just want to use your Sujeti email, let me know what that is, and I'll add you onto this spin group. And then um, if you have any questions, just send an email to that um, email address that I uh, sent out in the first email I sent to you guys, and that will go out to everybody. And then when I respond to it, it will also go out to everybody so that um, we're all on the same page if anybody has any issues. Um, last time, for instance, somebody had a problem getting their emulator set up. Um, you know, if other people were having that problem, we could all work on it together instead of having to, um, you know, kind of go one by one and, and set everybody up. Um, I'm not expecting you guys to have any problems with it, but if you do, uh, we will, you know, do what we can to make sure that you're able to get up and running as soon as possible. 
So with that, I'm going to um, end this session. Um, I will send out a, um, an email that has the homework assignment on it. I'll actually add it onto the spin group here uh, so that you guys can see it, uh, so that you're aware of what you can do. Um, what I'll do every, t every week, I will send you guys not only um, the textual requirements, but also screenshots of what it should more or less look like. I'll let you guys have creative liberty on laying out individual elements, but um, I'll at least show you guys, you know, this screen should look more or less like this. It should have this, these fields, things like that, um, so that it's um, pretty clear, um, you know, what it is that we're going to be grading you guys against, uh, and you're not confused. So with that, uh, I'm going to shut this off. I uh, hope you guys have a good day, evening, not sure what time you're looking at this, and uh, shoot me this email uh, to get you onto the uh, mailing list as soon as possible. All right. Thank you.